But Liz is a lovely red haired lady and I would like to introduce Liz as both a network an Eden Project Communities Network member, an international storyteller and a really good friend. Liz, over to you. Thanks very much, Gronya. No pressure recording. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. I'm not sure how many of you were on our previous workshop that I did. This is just really a follow up. In the last workshop, which is called Earned Wisdom, I looked at strategies for engaging with older people to share some stories with them, but also to get them to share their memories. And the interesting thing is that since I last did that workshop, I've had a lot more experience uh, of doing it online. Obviously, we're living in very strange times. As a storyteller, I feed off my audience. I don't go in with a set agenda. I get responses back. And that's why I like to have you even on gallery view here rather than individual, because I can actually see real people's faces. Otherwise, I'm just talking to a machine. But since then, I've been doing my dementia group I'm doing it today, this afternoon at two o'clock. And um, working with people with dementia online, if you'd asked me six months ago, I wouldn't have heard of it for a start, but also I'd have thought, no, I don't think that will work well. It's working exceptionally well because the people are much more confident. They're in their own homes. They're in their own surroundings. When you bring them out to a center or a group, or even we used to bring people here, you know, everything's different. So they're sitting in their own homes. They've all managed to get on. Some of them have relatives there to help them others are doing it by themselves but the feedback is really good and I'll talk a wee bit about what's working really well on that the other group I'm working with uh, which is on a Tuesday night is a group of older people in County Tyrone and County Fermanagh which is in the western part of Northern Ireland um, many of those people are living alone they're isolated with a couple of couples and it's really uh, great to get them engaged in conversation so as a storyteller, you may think that all my job is, is talking, but no, listening is much more important. And for many people, they have nobody to listen to them. They have great stories, but nobody to listen to them. So I'm going to share a few bits and pieces, but because it's a conversation, I'm not going to dominate. I'm going to ask you to come in and chat and there's not too many people on. So that's really makes it very easy. But I, I had a real find after the last session. Kath will recognize this. I bought Kath's book and it's terrific. Can I recommend it to you? It's called Kitchen Cupboard Cures, Traditional Remedies from the Days Before You Could Afford the Doctor. And this, as Sharon knows, is what we do when we go out. We talk about cures, we talk about um, potions, we talk about things your mother did, they gave you syrup of figs and castor oil and ghastly things in my childhood. But it's terrific, it's a great wee resource. Uh, a collection of home remedies. And that's a very important thing, I think, is to get people to talk about cures and so on. So I'm going to start this conversation. And now, Kath, you can maybe wait a wee minute because you'll know all this. Are there any of you here who, when you were growing up, you were given something that wasn't, I'm not talking about conventional medicine, but for example, if we get stung with a nettle, you know what to do to cure a nettle sting. Sharon, I know, did any of the rest of you know what to do? Pam, do you know? Sharon, do you want to tell them? <laughs> Say again. Well, Pam? Uh, uh, doc, doc Leaves was our thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the way rhyme, Sharon? I don't. No. Docking in, docking out, take the sting of the nettle out. And I always <laughs> tell people if you just rub a dock leaf, if you're in the middle of the city, it's hard to find, but that, then you probably wouldn't get stung by a nettle in the first place. So those are sort of things. Or cures for warts, many, many cures for warts. You know, really? Kath, do you want to give us one or two? So it's not just me talking all the time. I would to tell you, to um, be honest with you. Sorry. Kath? Kath? To be honest, with warts, we could go on all day. And it's, it starts with just very simple ones. And one of my favourite ones um, was shared with me years ago by somebody who just said, nibble it. And I thought, I don't know. <laughs> No. Um, what she was talking about was actually using your saliva, but it has to be your saliva first thing in the morning when the acidity is high and whatever. And so if you nibble your wart, apparently that gets rid of it. But if the wart's on the back of your neck, I don't know how you do that really. So <laughs> you're on your own with that one. <laughs> the most common one here is to cut a potato in half, rub a half and bury a half. 
And as the buried ah. potato rots, then the wart will fall off. Yeah, now the, the way I've heard that one is that you cut it in half, rub the starchy side of half of the potato onto your wart, but then you have to cut that half into five and Ooh. bury it in five different places in regional variations on I'm the so same so, sort of thing. And, and they really fascinate me that the way that people sort of take a cure and then it has its sort of personalised personalized slant on it, I suppose, but yeah. The best one, the best one was a man in a nursing home in Antrim and he bought your wart from you. Yeah. He gave you, he gave you two bob as he called it, you know, so he gave me 10 pence. I didn't have a wart, but that's what he would do. So these are things, these are very important and people who've grown up a long time ago. And I know that uh, Vivelle is away in America, but even when I'm in America, when you start to talk to people about um, different things, home cures, like uh, you, you all know about Jack and Jill and vinegar on brown paper. My mother would have been a great believer in red flannel, put red flannel against your chest. And there's lots of these old things, um, but horrible things like laxatives, like syrup of figs, Ooh, awful stuff. You know, hopefully nowadays our diet is such that we don't necessarily need these things, but you can imagine what it was like. So cures is a very important. Here's for Carl saying for a sore throat, a lump of butter with sugar on it. That's quite a good one. Uh, Sharon, any you can think of that you've heard? I mean, hoop and cough. Do you know the ones for that, any of you? Let's hear you, Sharon. I, sorry. Yes, Sharon. Uh, um, to pass, if it's a, a young child or a baby with a hoop and cough, you pass it on to the belly of the donkey. Sure. Three times, you know, it has to be passed. And I've heard that a lot of the older people, you know, old country people telling me that. And they would have taken you up to the gas works as well. You know the way you get this coal tar expectorant and cough mixture? Well, they said that I can't imagine the fumes that the gas works would do anybody any good, but that's the sort of thing. So I'm going to tell you a story. Is that all right if I tell a story, Grania? Because usually when I do storytelling, there's no point in talking about it without doing it. And this is a story that's very familiar to Sharon as well. It was set in Belfast and it's set a long time ago when the workmen would come home on a Friday night in big clumps with their pay packets in their, in their top pocket. And your pay packet was a brown envelope with a wee clear bit in it sometimes. So here's the story. Billy loved Friday nights. Oh, Thursdays was rotten. Thursdays was only old thin soup. But Friday night, he'd wait for the tramp of the men's heavy boots around the corner. And when the men would come around, he would run and his daddy would catch him up in his arms and swing him around. And he'd feel a stubbly chin and maybe even the beery breath because maybe daddy stopped off on the way home. Run on, son, run on and get the basket. And Billy would run into the house and get down his basket. And his father would come in and take the pay packet out of his pocket and open it up and take out a crisp five pound note. A lot of money in those days. Well, son, what's yours? A sausage supper, daddy. For those not from Belfast, sausage and chips. Right, you go down the chip shop and you get two fish suppers, fish and chips, and a sausage supper, and mind you that money. So Billy put the fiver down inside his glove, took the basket and headed out. It was a typical frosty winter's night. The pavements were gleaming, so he started to slide. And I don't know if any of you people online ever slid down the pavement, catching onto the lamppost, sliding again. But here, when he got down to the corner, he went thump down the ground. When he got up, who was standing watching him? But that old man around the corner, he didn't like him. He, he was very pretty, wore those old gloves with the fingers out of them and he had old ragged clothes. And the old man said, what about you, Billy? Which is Belfast for hello, son. Well, Billy didn't like him. He didn't speak to him. And he ran on down to the chip shop. And if any of you can remember this, the whole window was all steamed up and he could smell the vinegar and the frying fat. And when he went in, the woman said to him, after he waited a good while, what's your son? Two fish suppers and a sausage supper, Mrs. Please and thank you. Very good manners. And he watched as the fire sizzled and he watched as the fat was shaken off and the chips and the fish were wrapped up in newspaper. Salt and vinegar, son. Yes, please, Mrs. Wrapped it all up reaches up your basket and she threat, set three steaming parcels into the basket. Where's your money, son? 
his money was away. He says, I lost my money. And he burst out crying in front of everybody. That's all right, son. You reach me up those parcels. I'll keep them warm till you come back with your money. <laughs> Billy, he was crying. He was wiping his nose and his sleeve. His daddy was going to kill him five pounds. He came down the street looking everywhere. He didn't know what to do. And there was that bug and I lad from around the corner. Oh, I, oh, I don't want to speak to him. Is this your son? And the old man held out his old dirty glove and there was the fiver. You dropped it son, when you fell. Oh, thank you, mister. And he ran back to the chip shop and he paid over the money and he got his parcels and he came past, thank you, mister. And when he got into the house, his daddy said, Billy, were you away to hard glass for that fish? And you know, Billy never forgot that Friday night. And every time he saw that old man after that, he always spoke to him. And that's the story. And the thing about stories, stories, those older people would have grown up listening to stories. We have a man who comes on every Saturday night, Jim Delaney, he's 89 years old, and he sings in a tenor voice like a linnet. And he learned all his songs when those men were walking home, maybe from the pub, and they'd stand outside and sing at street corners. How very different is that from our older people now, secluded in their nursing homes, maybe with no visitors, in their houses. So what can we do? We can use this medium of Zoom. And we're going to do something else. We are going to record storytellers on film and make DVDs and send them out. We're trying to get funding for that at the minute. Send these DVDs out to nursing homes and to lonely people on their own because most people have something to play a DVD on even in these days. So that's what we're going to do. Wait till we read this chat from Vivella. My baba grew up with cupping. She wore a yellow organdy dress for graduation and the cut marks showed through the organdy. Oh my goodness. Ah, when you think about these, the memories you have. So I'm going to go back to all of you. Have any of you have memories of people in your own family who told you stories? Let's see, just raise a hand if you want to tell me something about it. Yes, well, Kath, Grania, tell us about you. Give, join, make Grania work here. Yes, Grania. So, um, who would have yeah. told you stories? I'll let Janine in. Who would have told stories? Well, um, like my family are all from Cushendall, um, on my mum's side, and my uncle Chris my, is my great uncle, lived with us in the house, and um, he was a great one for ghost stories and telling me stories of different things that went on in Cushendall in the old days. So it, it, whenever you lose those people from your life, it's quite sad because they don't seem to be coming behind, you know. So I'm always trying to encourage my mom to tell me stories of the days when she was growing up and her brother um, also does the same for me. So I, I think it's important that we all do learn that kind of, a built, well, just even hold on to those family stories and, and share them on down in the hope that they continue to get passed along. But yeah, I think um, storytelling is a massive part of Irish culture anyway, yes. but um, it is a concern that it's maybe we rely so much these days on the on the internet that that might die out. So here's you know, a man in uh, Bally Castle, David Quinney, me said that I should be called a provoker of stories because that's what I like to do. And that's what you all have to do. You know, if you go to an older person, and say, have you any stories? They'll immediately say no. But I quite often, well, sometimes I am stupid, but I sometimes act stupid. And I say, I wonder, could you help me? You know, if you ask people for help, they usually want to help you. So I say, I was trying to remember the name of, I was trying to think of that shop that used to be, and people will help you with this mm -hmm. and they love to help you with it. And another thing, I mean, you talked about ghost stories. Ghost stories are really strong. Different parts of England, Scotland, all over. People will know a place that was supposed to be scary. We were told a lot of these stories to keep us safe. Don't do that or the bogeyman will get you. Oh, well, there's a character called Johnny Dark that went round Belfast. There was Galloper Thompson. He was supposed to be a highwayman. And almost every region not just in the UK, but all over the world, will have stories like that. So you, what you really need to do, and again, from a tip point, if you have a list of questions, I don't mean sit there with a the list in front of you and read them out, but have questions in your head that you can put to people. And there are certain topics that will always get people to come back. You know, if you say, if you have a story, yeah, if somebody says, have you a story, of course your mind goes blank. But I'm going to ask you all, we're going to see people maybe haven't spoken yet. Can you think of a meal or a dish from childhood that you just could not wait to get home for 
or a special treat, something. Roz, can you think of anything when you were a child that you just loved to look forward to? Or Victoria, can you think of anything that was just a special meal? Who can tell me? Victoria. I enjoyed my grandma's dishes, so there were some, you know, in Hungary, I, I mean from Hungary, usually have uh, for lunchtime, like a soup type of thing and a second course. And uh, there was a bean soup, it was one of my favorites, and um, pasta with the poppy seeds, that's great, green poppy seeds. So that's, that, they were my <laughs> favorites, what my <laughs> grandma made really well. Did you know there's a great revival of storytelling in Hungary and we have a wonderful Hungarian storyteller who comes on to my sessions on a Saturday night, Maya. And so she's she's actually coming to a workshop I'm doing tomorrow morning. Great storytelling. Anybody else think of something? A meal that you just loved, a dish that you just loved. You see, we would have had things here like there's a thing called Mila Krushi or another word for it was Scab the Beggar. Again, the names vary. It was yellow meal yellow meal fried in bacon fat just poor food but tasty tasty food and again when I talk to the older people they can remember that or and you should all remember this was there any sort of sweets that you loved or candy in Vivella's case a type of sweet again if you talk to older people they had rationing they didn't have any sweets but people like me born after the war that's why our teeth all went because sugar came in you know so who can tell me about a type of sweet that they loved Yes, Kath. Sherbet fountains. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sherbet fountains are my favourite. Yeah. The licorice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, of course, that always leads on to what we would call Kali. Um, they're called rainbow crystals now. The sort of, do you remember those sort of crystals? Yeah. That, yeah, that you, you dumped your finger in and your finger went bright yellow. So it looked as if you were a chain smoker or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but just going back to the food, Liz, um, I, you can probably tell from my accent, I, I'm from Stoke-on-Trent, and our, our sort of regional dish in Stoke-on-Trent is something called lobby, which everybody else would call stew, but basically, because you just lobbed it in the pan, <laughs> it's called lobby. And to be honest, people in Stoke absolutely rave about lobby all the time. Now, to me, although I've grown up in Stoke, I was born in Durham, so I, I was never raised on lobby. But Is when I was given lobby, lamb? beef or lamb, uh, usually beef, but it's usually made with the minced leftovers from Sunday. In the past, that's how it would have been. Um, so f for me, I was like thinking, well, this is just stew by any other name. And so for me from the Northeast, it was broth made with a ham hock. And that that would be, um, yeah, I, I, could, I could drool now just thinking You're about that. Uh, that. That was amazing, yeah. Well, food is a great trigger, talking about Definitely. food. Definitely. When we do talk about, when you do talk about the rationing times, again, a lot of people live through war times and the rationing and the hard times. Um, we had uh, Rafa, who was on last night, a storyteller from Israel who lives in Amsterdam. His granny was a Holocaust survivor. I think Sharon heard him last night. A terrific, a fantastic storyteller. These are important stories. These stories must not be lost. You know, we have treasure there. And all of these older people, the people in Fermanagh, I see Nula's writing about fairies. The people in Fermanagh know a lot about fairies. Did I tell you the story the last time about Marble Halls? I don't think I did. Could I tell you? Is it all right if I tell another story? I just talk. But this is a story I use with the Fermanagh people to get them talking. A man called Brian Gallagher wrote a fantastic book, which we can put in the chat, Barefoot and Malanini. And Brian wrote about growing up in this rural area. And he said he used to be sent to get buttermilk from an old lady who lived in a cottage down a long lane. She was always very clean and tidy, but the place was fallen down round her. Oh, that challenge, of course. Oops. And one day, somebody's not muted, and one day, one day as he came down the lane, he heard her singing. She sang, I dreamt I dwelt in marble holes. And she was standing, singing to the fireplace with her back to the window. So he went, <clears throat> and when she turned around, she had tears running down her cheeks. So he took the buttermilk away, went. He went off to college to learn to be a teacher and another brother took over that job. 
And once when he was home on holiday, he heard the old lady had died. And he went to her funeral, which was a miserable affair, just a few people. They'd whitewashed the cottage, they'd made an effort. And he stood there while the grave digger was filling in the grave. And he said, did you know much about her? She always seemed very well brought up. Oh, very sad story. Her father was a big farmer. And when the parents died, they left the farm to her brother. And as they say here, he drank the land, he drank the farm, he just took to drink. And so they were reduced to living in that wee cottage. She stayed with her brother, she looked after him. And did she never marry? She looked like a good looking woman. Huh? She fell in love with a young police constable and he was promoted to sergeant and posted away. And he wrote and asked her to marry him. And she wrote back and said she would. And she gave the letter to her brother to post, but he ripped it up and he threw it into the waters of Loch Earn. I dreamt I dwelt in marble halls. Oh, such a sad story. But when I tell that story, I hear stories. A woman in Carlo who told me that happened to her aunt. Her brother didn't want her to leave him, so he ripped up the, the letter. So these are very sad things, but courtship, how you met your partner, how you, that's a really good trigger. How did people meet? Even people who have sadly had losses in their lives love to tell you about their John when they met John and he was 19 years old. These are great things to get people talking. How did you meet? Do it with children as well. Do you know how your parents met? A sweet boy put up his hand. You'll know who this is, probably Grant. My daddy had a cow calving and my mommy came and she was the vet and she calved the cow. I imagine the romance of meeting over a calving cow. But that, she's actually my vet from Kuach. And I said, oh, your mommy would be so pleased you told me that, you know. So the stories you get are amazing. It's terrific. Terrific fountains of treasure. Yeah. Are any memories a treasure? No. Everyday stuff. Well, I think, you see, the treasure is not in the sherbet fountain or the uh, licorice, all sorts of, the treasure is in the remember of who you shared them with, who gave you the money for it. Did you do an odd job to get that money? Uh, did, some, did you find money and, and buy sweets? I think the treasure, and that's what's really sad about the times they're living in, the treasure is in the sharing. The treasure is in the remembering. Now, not everybody had happy times. And again, be very aware of this work. Sometimes this work, if you're calling it that, can, can touch a nerve. I was telling stories at Tolly Carnet, our storytelling group one night, and a lady started to cry. I racked my brains as I was finishing the story thinking, what in that story would have made that woman cry? And I went up to her afterwards and I said, did I upset you? She said, no, no, you mentioned Cecil Brennan. And Cecil Brennan was a friend of my late husband and he died two months ago and I haven't been able to cry. But just hearing Cecil made me cry. You know, you have no idea. And sometimes crying can be actually therapeutic. Oh, Brian and Daddy were great friends. Oh, isn't that lovely? Brian Gallagher is a, a retired headmaster from Fermanagh. Nula, where are you based? That is a really good thing. Um, no matter where you're based in the country, the teachers that you remember, the good ones and the bad ones, oh, they remember the bad ones all right. Um, I love that. Uh, Nula. As I was thinking there as well, just while you were talking about how um, I was at a big lunch in Belfast years and years ago. Um, and just, you know, on the kind of the intergenerational connections. So one of the things that my gran always loved to do was um, talk to me when I'd been out to a disco or something and ask me, you know, did I get a dance and who did I get a dance with? And then reminisce on all of her dances and, you know, her own childhood and you know, teenage years. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes younger people forget that older people had so, exciting lives that went ahead of them absolutely. and all sorts. <laughs> but, you know, I go to a nursing home in Marafell. It's one of these absolutely splendid places with uh, a cinema and gorgeous ensuite rooms. These rooms would be... I mean, to me, they're like luxury hotel rooms and the older people in there, they wouldn't have been used to that. I mean, it costs, I don't know, it's about a thousand pounds a week. It's huge. Oh, anyway, this, this, woman, this woman came in and she said she was at a dance with her fiancé and she was sitting on his knee. And this is a great story. And she said this disreputable fella came in. It was obviously just come in from the fields and he had manure hanging on him and he'd old dirty overalls and he'd had a drink or three. 
and he came staggering over towards her and she said to her husband, oh, John, 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 don't let him ask me for a dance. And he says, can I dance your girlfriend? John says, surely take her on. And she found herself dance with this guy and he was smelly. And she said, you know, I still married him after that, after him doing that to me. But the delight, it's the delight that you see in people's eyes. And it's not about us and how we feel. So, to be honest with you, I always feel better after talking to people like that. But it's the delight that you're giving them in the shared memories. We did a thing called Sharing Tales. And we went into three, um, they were, they're not even there anymore. They were called geriatric wards. Those, they're all out in the community now or in nursing homes now. But there were people there. There was a man there that hadn't walked. This sounds like the raising of Lazarus. But I brought Scottish storyteller Duncan Williamson in. And he played, he had a jaw harp. He played his jaw harp. Come on, arose to the astonishment of the nurses and swung a wee nurse round because it reminded him of his youth. Who knows what it was like the next day, but at least he arose on that occasion. So these are things that are important. If you're in a part of the country where there were fairies, as we were in Ireland, Nula's talking about that, people will tell you, don't go there, don't cut that tree down. And that's what I absolutely love, to try and stimulate the conversation. But don't, whatever you do, go in and just ask. Don't just go in and say, have you any stories? Have any of you got any stories about? Um... So anybody else want to share anything? Liz, isn't that the same really no matter what age you are? Because, I mean, you know, getting young people to share stories. And I'm just thinking about that, you know, in the dances. And actually, for my grand now to know that people meet up online, you know, that would just be way beyond her. And I'm, I wonder, is there something in that around, you know, younger people kind of chatting and explaining the way they get together now? I mean, during lockdown, young people are meeting on Instagram and all sorts of places. So... Yeah. It might be an interesting thing, particularly when we're now looking for new ideas around what we can do between now and getting back to whatever normal is going to be. <laughs> How do we motivate young people to connect with the older generation outside their own families? And perhaps it isn't necessarily just about how we get older people to open up, but also how we motivate younger people to be more involved. Perfect, Granny, you read my mind. I'm starting on Friday. I'm doing a workshop for 16 to 18 year olds in storytelling. I floated it to see how it would go and a 15 signed up for it. And they all sound lovely. They're very ready. They said, dear Liz, I am 17 years old and this sounds like an interesting thing to do. Our schools are all closed here. So they're all off this week. So we're starting this week. And um, I'm going to suggest that, that they talk to older people in their family. They talk about this, they talk about that. And we're going to suggest some topics that they can, you know, just be talking around because they're fascinated. We did a great session. There's a place called Armoy, and we'd had about six teenagers and about six older people. It was quite interesting from a Northern Ireland point of view because the children were all Protestant and the older people were all Catholic. So that was a big learning experience because the older people be talking about going to mass and the children be going, what? You know, it was just totally out of the... So what sort of phone did you have, one said. And the older people were going, what? What sort of phone did you have? Did you have a Nokia? And they had to explain to them, they didn't even have a phone in their house. They might have had a phone in a neighbour's house. Certainly in my, when I was growing up, it was one woman had a phone and messages had to be carried backwards and forwards. The wee ones were fascinated by this. What sort of a car did you have? That's a great thing to get people talking, especially the older people who talk about the Ford Angler or the Ford Console or what they learned to drive in. You know, um, they didn't have a watch. You know, people say, to, and nowadays our kids have come back to not having watches. They use their phones for everything. So it's a very good experience to let them see the differences between, between the generations. There's a fairy fort behind mum's house. We were told, oh yes, if you get lost, it's called a fairy straying, a chacheron she, you know, that absolutely right. If you're out and a mist comes down, you get lost. It's a fairy straying. You take your coat off, you turn it inside out and you'll get home again. That's absolutely right. And the fairies can't do anything about it. You'll get out the field. Oh no, this is great. I go down to Inniskillen. I do a group with dementia in uh, Belmore Court and they have fantastic stories. And again, it's not just the people living with dementia, it's their relatives, their carers. They need a bit of uh, conversation and chat too. But often they are amazed. For example, my group this afternoon, I have a friend called Colin, who's a great singer. 
we're singing Johnny Cash, we're singing Elvis, because the assumption is, oh, it's all Vera Lynn. No, no, no. We have people in their 50s living with dementia. And they love all the country stuff, John Denver, Take Me Home. And as you know, when you do singing on Zoom, it's a bit raggedy, but boy, people are singing their hearts out. They absolutely love it. So that's something that everybody could do. There, Kath, only the local shop had a phone. They took messages. That was always it. And if, you, if the phone rang late at night, it was a death. You know, you were getting bad news if the phone rang late at night. Uh, I'm just reading the Pavilla's thing. Yeah, you put your jacket up of your head and make a noise. They think you're bigger. Oh, yeah, the mountain lions. There was one on. Don't know if anybody saw that video the other day of a person being chased by a mountain lion. Scared the life out of me on social media. But again, don't feel that because we're limited to this Zoom thing now that we can't do this. As I told you, it's working. Sharon has been on not just with my group with dementia, but with a group with head injuries. And you say, how would that work? Didn't it work well, Sharon? works really really well people are talking one woman had a dog with her that got us into talking about pets somebody talked about farming um there was a Pol um, lithuanian man came on i said labas how do you know labas i said well i try and make it my business to say hello in as many languages as i can um and then he talked about opera somebody else was talking about it's fantastic i think it's really important to do this What's Gronya saying? Oh, the phone box. The phone box and cushion doll, I have to tell you, and Gronya would know this, is a bit of an institution. There'd be messages passed, there'd be phone calls made at certain times and so on. Again, it was the only way you could communicate, ringing the phone box. And of course, the older people remember the operator who operated all these party lines and often listened in on conversations, you know. There's a great story a man told me, and I've heard various versions. He was working in England, one of what they called McAlpine's Fusiliers, left Ireland to go and work on the roads. And every Friday night, he would go into the pub. They all went there, spent all their money. And as he walked in, one of his best friends from Ireland walked out past him and just totally ignored him. I thought, what? Well, finally, he went and used the old switchboard thing and got phoning home. And they said, well, we're just going to ring you with some bad news for you. Your friend passed away today. And that was the friend he saw, like a premonition. The hair's going up in the back of my neck actually telling you that. But those are the sort of things. Or again, the ghost stories. So let's go back on our topics. Food, dances, social events. We used to go to things called beetle drives. Any of you old enough to remember beetle drives? It's terrific. I know, I love them. I'd love to do a beetle drive. I'm going to do it here one time. Beetle drives. Well, you show you shake a dice and you have to do a head and a body and the feelers and the four legs. Oh, fantastic fun. It's Beatles very much me. used as a way for the PTAs to fundraise, bringing older and younger people together. It's great fun. For, I remember as a teenager going and they were all old, old fogies as I thought, but it was a great fun, terrific fun. And uh, people cheat, you know, as well, which is interesting. <laughs> oh, yes. Hard playing is another thing. Some areas, other people say, even when we're talking about dances, my Fermanagh group, some of the ladies would never have been allowed to go to dances. So then I switched tack immediately and said, did you have church soirees? And of course they told me about soirees or we called them bun worries sometimes. You'd pay your money, you'd get your night's entertainment. So again, you have to be really ready. Sometimes when I'm doing funding applications, they say, what are you going to do? You can't actually specify, you can suggest a list of topics, but you switch from topic to topic depending on who you have. I want to tell you a story that points up something really important for me. I was working with a group in a place far from here and one woman dominated every week. On she went. Now people were getting to the stage going, <sighs> because group dynamics are very difficult sometimes. And she was beginning to annoy me and I'd say, I'm going to call her Jean, it wasn't her name. And I'd say, just hold on Jean, I think Patrick wants to say something. And Patrick was paralysed and it took him a long time to get speaking. So she was like, but now it was like, talk to the hand, a bit like my friend Padder, Sharon. But anyway, I'd have to say, just hold on a minute. I said, next week, we'll talk about working away from Ireland. Did any of you work in England? And loads of people have. So I knew this man that was paralyzed had been working on building sites in England and that sort. Of. So we'll get there in the next week. And I'm just opening my mouth and she said, I, and I went, oh, here she goes. Too far gone, she said, I remember 
I qualified as a nurse in Edinburgh. My fiance qualified as a doctor. And everybody was going, I didn't know she was engaged. Did she get married? Did, you know, they didn't know her that well. And she said, we decided to go to Canada and work there for a year and earn money and then come back and get, mar uh, get married. And she said, but we were only there two weeks and we had a car crash and he was killed and I was left in a coma. And when I come out, I couldn't talk and I could walk, I couldn't walk either. But she says, now I can get about pretty well and can I talk? And everybody just went, Phew. yeah, she can talk. If you've been deprived of your speech, of course you want to talk. So it actually built in a lot more empathy in the group. And I think, as I always say, when you take the time to listen to another person's stories, it shows great empathy towards them. Even in, in our context here in Northern Ireland, even if you are American politics favela, uh, even if your views are diametrically opposed to the other person's, at least if you do them the courtesy and the respect of listening to their story. And especially when we're doing this sort of work, gathering stories. Oh, we must tell you, Beto Drive's Vivella, it's, you have a, a square, it's all squared out and you have to, sh if you shake a six, isn't that for the body? And a five's for the head and a four's for the tail and three's for the, I can't remember, three's for the legs and the antlers. And the first one to complete a whole beetle shouts, Beetle! It's a wee bit like bingo, I suppose, in one way as well. So it's quite good. Um, yes, Bronya's asking, should we go into, would you like to go into breakout rooms to do a discussion? Can I ask what you think? Staff, the names of people. Oh, that's very important. Kath is just saying about the names. You have to know how people want to be called. I go around and in the days when you could touch people, I shake hands. If somebody's had a stroke, I maybe just pat them. People aren't, they're touch deprived. If people don't want to shake hands, that's fine. And I say, hello, how are you? I'm Liz. And what do they call you? And they'll say John or somebody will say, Mrs. White. Right, Mrs. White. Because my mother and my mother-in-law were never called by their maiden names. They were together for years. What do you think, Mrs. Martin? I don't know, Mrs. Weir. It was like, and then when they went out, it was like Mrs. Doyle out of Father Ted, they would fight over who paid. And my mother-in-law said, it's all right, Mrs. Martin, I'll pay and you fumble. That's <laughs> it's dreadful. So again, ask people what they want to be called. When my mother went into hospital, somebody, a wee doctor came, a wee doctor came over and said, well, Nellie, nobody, but nobody called my mother Nellie. Even daddy called her mummy and mummy called him daddy, you know. You have to find out what people are comfortable with. I didn't even know my parents' names. Mommy was mommy and daddy was daddy and that was it. So care settings. Would you like to go into breakout rooms? How are we going to assess the demand and the need here, people? Would you like to? Or are you happy to continue as we are? You can I give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. What do you yeah, think? I was just going to say, I think if people um, put a thumbs up, if they want to stay in a main group and continue a shared conversation like this, and then we'll just count the difference. Anybody put the thumbs up? So thumbs, thumbs up, up if you want to stay as we are now. Yeah, mostly so far. Yeah, and yeah. A, thumb, a thumbs up if you want to go into breakouts. Very I few. Think, I, I think stay. people want to stay as they are. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's good anyway. Do, um, um, miss out was, on something you wanted. Yeah. I was going to ask Sharon. Sharon is one of our experienced storytellers and going out into nursing homes, day centres. And I was just reading a review, Sharon, of something you did in, in that nursing home in Newry, where you got them all singing. Could you maybe share a, a favourite experience or something that surprised you or something that somebody did? Well, <clears throat> Liz had asked me to go to a nursing home in Killalay and uh, outside Belfast. So we set off on our journey and we found the nursing home. And when I went in, it was a huge big room. And the people were all sitting around the edge of the, you know, the room and with varying um, stages of dementia, some really, really severe, some in the early stages. But I went round and I shook hands with them all and I said, hello, my name's Sharon and what's your name? And hold their hands and have a wee chat and, and saying, oh, your sweater's a lovely colour. Oh, did you get your hair done today? You look lovely. And I came to this lady and she was sitting in the wheelchair and then I shook her hand. I said, hello, how are you? What's your name? Margaret. And she said to me, 
I bet you every morning you get up and you look in the mirror at yourself and you start singing, uh, hey, hey, good looking, what you got cooking? And I thought, I start to laugh. So then she said, no, no, I bet you you do. I bet you you do do that. And uh, so I took her hand and her and I started to sing the wee song. Hey, hey, good looking, what you got cooking? How's about cooking something up with me? And she said, yeah, she says, you're good looking, but you have a big fat ass. <laughs> So out of the mouths of babes, always be prepared because they'll tell you how it is. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're just a delight, a, an absolute delight. I have to say dementia is one of the, my favourite uh, uh, storytelling, you know, events that I, I really enjoy working with the people with dementia. And some of the stories are absolutely fascinating. It's so surprising because you're sometimes you're not expecting something and somebody starts to sing this beautiful voice and you think maybe and then I remember a man his wife said he hasn't sung for years but something triggers it so again one story a late storyteller called um John Campbell used to say one story borrows another um and I think every one of us should have something growing up you were all teenagers once what song did you remember what poem did you learn off by school a lot of these older people that we're working with had to learn everything off by heart they learned their rhymes mrs d mrs i mrs ffi mrs c mrs u mrs lty difficulty or there's uh some totally non-politically correct ones like arithmetic i read yes. and thought he might eat tobacco in church you know Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you there. I've just had a few people privately messaging saying they would be comfortable speaking in the breakout. Right. So I'm just going to say two of a conversation around intergenerational um, interaction and tips and learn earned wisdom, if you like, from storytelling. But also I love that um, title is because it reminds you of the earned wisdom of older people and you know what they have to impart to others as well that can sometimes be forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, so well, I wanted to do a chapter two because I felt like the first time around there was so much more conversation still going mm -hmm. and I just wondered if anybody would be up for a chapter three to kind of continue the conversation and to continue to learn some of those wee storytelling tips mm -hmm. and perhaps maybe we could hand over the the, um, the mantle to somebody else because I know we have some storytellers. Like Kath. Kath or Sharon or one of those people. Yeah, be anybody lovely. up? I mean, you're all on mute. So if you want to unmute, if anybody's up for leading the next one and maybe having a longer breakout. I want Kath. I want Kath to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be more than happy to. I, I mean, I, 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 as I explained to Liz and Gran, yeah, um, after the last session, I don't call it storytelling because mm. as a librarian, storytelling is something different to me. So... I work as a reminiscent specialist, or I like to call myself a collector and sharer of stories. And that probably does link in with the, the storytelling description. Yeah. Um, but I've worked in lots of different settings and, and been active in this area, yeah, since 1993. Yeah, it's a long time. And I Some people probably old, weren't yeah. born, oh no. Oh, no. With the... <laughs> Again, with the storytelling, I spend a lot of time trying to tell people that storytelling isn't just for kids. You know, this is book week in Northern Ireland, so it's very timely. We're having this conversation this week. Every night at eight o'clock on the library's NI portal, there's going to be a story told, a, an adult story. And I'm going to put in the chat, uh, the stories from the Glen Storytelling Festival are still online, free. So anybody anywhere in the world can be watching them. It's free to watch. And we recorded the storytellers sometimes out in the setting. And if you've any older people, I mean, people have told me they really enjoyed watching it. Different nursing homes have enjoyed watching it. Uh, some good stories. So reminiscence work is, is a great part of my work uh, as a storyteller. Again, and the intergenerational nature of it, I think is one of the most important things, getting the younger people and the older people to share. We actually did a project where the older people told their stories and then the younger people retold them. And the older people loved hearing their stories told back. And they say, wait, wait, you left a wee bit out there. No, you left a bit. So there was real engagement. And I think that worked very well. Um, I have got a, a book list, which I can send to you, Grania. Maybe um, 
Carol's asking about uh, the recorded resource. Now, I which think she's talking is. about the Glen Storytelling Festival. The Glen Storytelling. It? It's up in the chat earlier. Glen Storytelling Festival, free to watch. It's just up in the chat a wee bit. Um, also, folks, you can share your, you can save your chat. Um, so I yes. think just going back on what Kath said, it is important. It's an important comment, actually, that, you know, regionally we call things different things. And so if you were talking about storytelling, somebody might think you mean reading the book out loud. That's right. Um, yes. You know, so it, it is important that we kind of communicate that for the purpose of this, this video that we're talking about reminiscence and connecting and the generations through mm -hmm. conversations really and what you call that locally really matters in terms of what you're trying to search for um but be aware if you're searching for it across it, the internet it can be that you may be looking for intergenerational resources you might be looking for storytelling resources you might be looking network for does a lot of really good work here in northern Ireland. i'd love to hear what people talked about in their breakout groups is anybody up for sharing what you did talk about do you want to put your hand up if you're happy to share your conversation from the from the breakout? Oh, we're all very shy. I will. <laughs> I will if nobody else is volunteering. But we, we looked we looked at themes and the sorts of things that we feel comfortable with and how we might deliver them. Um, and we've got, we've got different experiences really. And I mean, certainly Nuala had some very, very interesting stories to share. Um, and obviously we heard from Sharon as well um, about her, her experiences, but we talked about school days and we talked about work as, as themes that, that you, you might use. Um, but I also shared um, the things I'm confident with and the things I'm not confident with mm -hmm. um, and I'm not confident with work to be honest because I find there's such a diversity that there's always somebody who's like well you haven't mentioned working dark pit and you know and you, you've suddenly alienated somebody so I, I try to focus on subjects where I feel there's a shared experience for everybody where if you go to work you know working in a pit is different to working in a bank and mm. um, and I, I can't sort of bring those together but I mean I have done some stuff with Manchester United um, and a lot of reminiscence training with their volunteers and that was very specific um, and looking at that one aspect of something where I wouldn't normally reminisce just on football mm -hmm. but there it was fine because that, that's what we were doing so it's horses for courses I think isn't it really? The work one the way I usually approach it is what was the first money you ever earned? Not Me too. Me too. Me that too. works really well because somebody got two and sixpence or somebody got you know 50 yeah. shillings yeah. So very, and then yeah. here we have the marriage ban and the civil service if you got married you had to leave work which is like alien to any younger person you had and to teaching yeah no i'm teaching yeah. a lot yeah you had to leave work when you got married which is just mm -hmm. so preposterous an idea so all of that i think it's 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 quite important um to uh, Liz, just uh, just yeah. to um say answer from the chat ross was as asking what was it you meant exactly when you said the older person told a story and the young person said it back. Are you talking about told like maybe a mythical story from there? No, no. What were you, if you could just explain just, that for us. What, just one of their own tales about something that happened to them at work or getting slapped by a teacher one day can be <laughs> as simple as that. You know, you know, Johnny told me that one day the boys were snowballing the girls at school and the teacher lined them all up and nobody admitted to it. So he went down the right and he was going to slap everybody. But no, Johnny ran away and he climbed up a pole in the classroom and the teacher was behind him snapping. Well, to hear that back, to hear your story back, it's like playing back theatre. It really makes them smile when they see, yeah. they think they can see themselves as that age group again. But you're telling it, yeah. if you like, in the third person, it, it works really quite well. Yeah, I, I did actually do that a few years ago. I don't know if anybody remembers the Their Past Your Future project. And yeah. um, I did it as um, caps and aprons performances. So um, the children collected the stories from the older people and then they turned it into a performance that the older people watched. And it was, it was brilliant because all we used was a series of hats 
um, and that, that, that they were our only costumes, hats and aprons were our only costumes and it was lovely seeing the older people go, that's, oh, lovely oh, that's idea. my story, that's my that's story. Lovely idea. It was, it was wonderful, it's so nice, it's so rewarding, but then of course some of the things had been misreported. Oh dear, then, no, oh, correct I, No, no, I didn't say that. And, yeah. well, Sharon, Sharon, who's on with us, she does the Belfast Blitz monologue, which she's written herself, and she wears the, her scarf and her pinafore, and she's got her washboard and her, her tin bath, and I mean, when she does that, it stimulates so many, so many memories. Oh, Sharon, tell them about Sandy Rowe and the bombing. Again, Belfast was badly hit by the Blitz and uh, President De Valera sent up the Dublin Fire Brigade. Tell them what the woman told you, Sharon, if you would. It's a really good story. Well, as Liz says, um, the monologue stirs up a lot of memories for the people. And of course, when uh, I finished the performance, I love to hear the stories from the people in the audience. And this uh, man came up and he said, yes, he said, Chan, you just told my story. And I said, did I, Bella? Yes, 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 you did. He said, you know, our street got a direct hit. I says, oh my goodness, that must have been terrible. He says, yes. And he says, as you know, he says, um, uh, Dave Lira, he says, got a phone call. This was like the president the south of, of Ireland and uh, he said the people in Belfast were saying De Valeria you'll have to help us we've, we've been under attack you know during the blitz so he said De Valeria agreed that the Dublin fire brigade would come up to Belfast to help out so he said our street was demolished he says and from six doors up from where we lived he says that all the the whole row of terraced houses was just rubble. They were to the ground. So he said the Dublin Fire Brigade came, he says, and they were over the houses, lifting the rubble as quickly as they could to see if they could save any lives. And they were at the house where Sadie Saunders lived. And they were shouting, hello, hello, is there anybody there? Hello. And Sadie was buried under the rubble and she heard the foreign tongue of the Dublin uh, men shouting down, hello, hello. And she shout, good God, don't tell me the Germans has invaded us. And uh, so they said, not at all, Sadie, not at all, we are not German. We're, uh, we're the Dublin Fire Brigade. She says, good God, don't tell me Hitler's blew me the whole way to Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> Great, fantastic, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Right. But yeah. we've come to the end. Um, yep. 